Hi, good afternoon. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Godfrey Ratsam, <clears throat> who will be speaking on a relatively important topic, despite the audience, because there are a couple of university committees still in meeting right now, and um, it's the first week of study week. So the audience is impacted. But counteracting that, we have here a very distinguished guest, Professor Nanakan. And in a sense, his presence is a good thing for this particular seminar because he is in eco engineering, one of his many pursuits. And Godfrey's work is about tar sands exploitation. One cannot talk about tar sands exploitation without giving some thought to its impact on the environment and the ecology of the surrounding area. Now, Godfrey will explain to you what his rationale for doing this is. And let me hasten to say that a lot of work has been done on tar sands around the world and their exploitation. A fair amount of work has been done here in Trinidad. Godfrey is a doctoral candidate. And as such, his work must bring something new to the table. Because Right here at UGT, we have people who have been in Tar Sands area for a while. So, in one sense, Godfrey's talk will be covering some of the things that he will be trodding paths that others have. But the difference here is one, the difference that we are hoping for is one, we're going to be very systematic in the approach systematic to, in, in, with regard to estimating the actual reasons, which is important because of the cost of exploitation, and systematic in terms of mapping via a risk assessment, as, he, as Godfrey will explain, the impact on the environment. Systematic with regard to trying to optimize the exploitation method given the type of tar sands we have. And you will, he will tell you it's really just very viscous bitumen, which has to be ultimately converted into crude oil. So there are lots of aspects to this. As I said, although people have trod these parts before, the geostatistical analysis is new, and in a sense, the systematic approach is new. Okay, because there has been a lot of research, but somewhat haphazard. So, without Godfrey is also on a panel with Petro Trim, because the government, Ministry of Energy, is that right? Has given Petro Trim a mandate to investigate the tar sands with a view to exploiting them, to bolster the, the crude oil reserves. So, he will be able to give us, I don't know if he intends to, but he could have given us some insight into how that is progressing. But for the time being, let me not anticipate any more of this talk. Without further ado, Godfrey Ransom. Thank you, Professor Zout. Thank you, you all this, this afternoon. My presentation this afternoon is to simply outline to you the status of tar sands exploitation in Trinidad. What has been happening? And to introduce a new concept towards its exploitation with regard to the determination of the bitumen reserves through geostatistics. As I said, I'm going to touch on it briefly on a general scale. I won't go into any deep mathematical equations, but it's just to point out, in fact, what it's about, what exists, and how we intend to go about determining what the reserves are towards the commercial exploitation of the hydrocarbons. To do so, I would briefly indicate 
a mere description of the tar sands in which you mean for those who may not be acquainted with what tar sands are. Talk about where are they located, the global occurrences locally. Talk about how is it mined, extracted. Then why are we looking at geostats? And just indicate briefly, without too much detail, the various steps into geostatistics so that you have an appreciation of what is involved. Tarsans are really dirty, a dirty substance, really. It's a black clay, silty sand mixed with bitumen, clay, silt, water. But in fact, it's a hydrocarbon, all right? And we can extract from that tar sands bitumen. Very important, which in fact can be converted into lots of various products, like crude oil, which can be used in refinery for lots of products, jet fuel, gasoline, etc. This is just a little diagram of what a tar sands is. It's just a bowl of black, dirty substance. You can hold it. If you squeeze it, your, your hands will be dirty and black, and you, you might find some tar sands, some bitumen creeping out. Well, this is what tar sands look like. Now, lots of confusion arises between heavy oil and, and bitumen, so I thought it best to differentiate between what is heavy oil and what is bitumen. In fact, heavy oil and bitumen occupy more than six, two thirds of the total oil resources much more than conventional crude oil. But the distinguishing feature is that bitumen consists of a very low API gravity. API, of course, means the, the density, right? It's less than 10 degrees API, and a very, very viscous crude of over 10,000 centipoise. So that is a distinguishing feature between heavy oil and bitumen. Other heavy oil, as you might see, which can be pumped up and produced naturally has a much higher gravity between 10 and 22 degrees, right? And has a much, in fact, a higher viscosity. So where are these resources located? The world is full of resources, of hydrocarbon resources, heavy oils. But there's only one country, Canada, Alberta, which actually produces this heavy crude called bitumen. And lots of controversy, in fact, daily is being debated as to what, should the government continue doing this thing because of the environmental impact. But nevertheless, the reserves are tremendous. It's estimated that Canada has about 1.2 trillion, that is 1.2 by 10 to the 12 barrels in place of bitumen. And the recovered reserves are just about 1.7 minus 10 to the 9, or 1.7 billion. Imagine. TNT, Trinidad, our reserves estimates range from 0.5 to 2 by 10 to the 9. No, there's no comparison. Billion. And that is, in fact, why, in fact, this study is being done. Because there are lots of studies in the past have indicated, well, we've got tremendous reserves of bitumen. We can exploit the bitumen, we can produce it. But the fact is, how much is there? And the range is so large that to really spend money to extract, we need to determine with, with precision what exists. Now, this map indicates the areas where the heavy oil is found in TNT. And to give you an indication as to why, in fact, the geologists state that this has come from an extension of the eastern Venezuelan sedimentary basin. That's where the source rock of the hydrocarbons exist. And has migrated through the Orinoco River down to the southwestern peninsula of Trinidad and Tobago. The area in question of which a study, in fact, 
with focus is this area to the south. Consists of parrylands and the forest area. Those are the names of the fields that exist, parrylands and forest. The other areas, much to the north, Vestini, Brighton, and so on, which also consists of reserves of bitumen, but the large, better, the greater areas are here in the Parallands area, and there's where the, the, the study is being focused on. So just to give you an idea of the geology, because the geology is very important, especially when we're looking at geostatistics. In fact, the word geostatistics comes from geo, geology, so that we must understand not just the data, but where the data comes from and have an appreciation of what it means. So that the deposits part form, of the, form part of the, what we call the, the mon Lefer formation. The mon Lefer formation, in fact, belongs to the tertiary era. You've got different eras, all right? And it belongs to the Pliocene group. It consists of cyclical sequences of sand, silts, and clays. Now, what is interesting, because it's very shallow, and there are several outcrops, that is, you can see formations of this substance on the surface, large chunks of it on the surface, outcropping in different directions. And the beds, that is, the way the formations dip, they dip gently in a, in a southwestern direction. And the sands, of course, the sands are distinguished. They're not just one big block. They're distinguished in various, what we call stratigraphic units. All right? And this has been deduced from boreholes, which were dug, which were uh, dug years ago by Petrotrin, the operating company, to analyze exactly the nature of the sands. The main sands, of course, are called the A sands or the rock because it's the, the better type rock. It's oil impregnated. Then you've got B, stained, and C, not much oil in it. I would just wish, wish first to indicate, as I mentioned, the, the stratigraphic units of the, the five units, A, B, C, the N, E. These are the units, of course, where the, the tar sands exist. Very shallow. This is 100 feet, right? And I mentioned the outcrop to the surface. So lots of years, you, you know, you have large mounds of tar sands on the surface. But the C and D units are the units where most of the sands exist. Those are the better units. And we go way down to about 600, 700 feet. So that's the kind of range we're looking at. 100 to 700 feet, 600 feet for the most. Back up, just to give you an idea of the kind of rock we talk about, the reservoir, the rock. Uh, the bitumen saturation is about, in terms of weight, 14%. The porosity of the sands, in terms of the intergranular pore space is just about 36%. And the net sand thickness, in other words, how thick, in fact, are the units in each area? It's about 108 feet, 110 feet, because in some areas you might have 200, others 40, 60, 50, so that on average, it's about 108 feet. Good. Now, let's talk about how are we going to get this thing out. So we know the sands exist, the tar sands exist. We know where they are found. How do we extract it? In Alberta, where in fact currently extraction is being done daily and significantly, they use what they call strip mining. You've got very large, massive, huge trucks, right? that really dig and excavate all that stuff, right? And put them into, into, into different units where they are separated. 
Once they are dug and crushed and separated, how do we extract the bitumen? There are three methods, aqueous, solvent, and retorting. In Canada, aqueous, the aqueous method is used. That is, the tar sands are diluted with water and caustic soda. The slurry is mixed with naphtha and separated in special vessels. Now, this aqueous method of extraction is what has caused the environmentalists to stand up and say, listen, this is enough. Because they create what we call lots of tailing puns, right? Of huge, massive wastes, toxic waste. And they say, of course, it's, it's cyanide, it's fluoride, it's the CO2 emissions. The environmentalists say that, you know, it isn't worth it. And even today, in fact, they are trying as, as much as possible to see, in fact, whether this can be stopped. But this is just up to a certain depth, up to about 250 feet or so, where, in fact, because of the overburden, that is the amount of material above the sand you can excavate to get at the real thing. Another method is the solvent uh, extraction, whereby the oil is mixed and crushed with the solvent and recovered. But that is being investigated. It's not being heavily used. It's still being researched. Also, the retorting system involving the crushing and the heating, distillation, and cracking of the product. So those are the key treat methods. But currently, Alberta, Canada, the main producer so far, uses an aqueous uh, type extraction. Now, at depths greater than 250 feet, where extraction by excavation is, is not possible, you use what we call in situ recovery methods. That is, trying to recover the bitumen in place through injection of solvent, sorry, injection of steam into the formation. What it does, it lightens the bitumen and allows it more or less to flow, okay? So the steam assisted gravity drainage is one of the main methods in this area, all right? Another area, in fact, which is being on the investigation to is called the Vapex, similar to SAJD, but using, in fact, thermal solvents. So what's, having said all that, what is the objective of the study, of the research? The fact is, we know that the crude oil production in Ireland, Trinidad and Tobago, has declined tremendously over the years. Currently, we produce less than 100,000 barrels, on average 96,000. And the prognosis seems to think that is, we, we, unless we do something drastically, explore, find new oil, the decline would increase. Now, having reserves of tar sands in the southeastern, southwestern peninsula, Parallands and so on, the question is, can we exploit those sands reserves to boost our reserves? Currently, Patrick is looking at that through, through a government uh, mandate. They were asked to see exactly the extent of the reserves of, of, uh, of bitumen and how, in fact, they can be exploited. But their approach has been the normal approach, which is the traditional volumetric methods. That is, they will take the data, and where the, there is insufficient data, they would extrapolate and interpolate to come up with their volumes. What we want to stress now is to look at the, the, another method. We want to focus here on looking at geostatistics, whereby we would look at the nature of the, 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 the formation, its geology, and use the applications of geostatistics to come up with refined, even more representative values of the reserves. And this is important because on this would depend the commercial viability of the, of the project. As I said before, the range of values 
is between 0 0.5 and 2 billion barrels. What is the exact value? So to apply geostatistics to obtain robust determination of tasks and parameters and to determine the reserves is really, the, in essence, the objective. So what is this about geostatistics? It's really a tool that uses the spatial variability. It uses spatial modeling. In other words, it must understand the data. It must understand the geology. So when you interpolate, you must understand the trend of the data. As we said, we see the sands dipping in a certain way. We have to take that into consideration. We have to consider the characteristics of the rocks. So it's not just interpolation statistically. A very key important tool in this approach is the variogram. And that's the building block of geostatistics. So it really quantifies the relationship between variables, all right? And it looks at the structure of the data. And it's the basis for which other techniques can be used, other techniques triggering another simulation. It's really the formative first phase. This is just a simple mathematical equation of what the variogram is about, OK? So that we have, in fact, data samples of, of values here. Let's say this is where the thickness of a well, let's say 200 feet here. Here's 400 feet. We know the distance between these two wells. All right, we know the trend. So the variogram gives us the mean square of the differences, right? between the data, this is the HA. That's the mathematical equation. But it takes into account the direction of the sand. It takes into account the, the isotropic nature of the sands. It takes into account the homogeneity of the sands, etc. Not just a mathematical uh, interpolation. So that it uses that building block afterwards for future predictions. Another picture of the variogram, of course, and the main characteristics of this, in fact, is the range. That is where you have a constant variance called a sill after a certain distance. And this, in fact, is a structure that tells you the correct fit. You've got lots of data. But when you plot this data, in fact, you have to understand and play and analyze to determine the correct fit that would be in consonance with the reservoir you're speaking about. Because you have to understand you're speaking about shallow sands of a particular nature. All right, the nugget, and this term became, has come about because really the Vigram has started before from mineral analyses, and therefore, you, you, once the question of looking for nuggets of gold and minerals came about, and uh, that's where the term was applied, so that where you have got, a, in fact, in areas of very, very small distances where you've got discrepancies, you've got a nugget variance. But we won't go into much of that today. Great. This is now the predictive part of the geostatics based on the previous variogram model. It's a regression technique, right? And uses a combination of weights based on the model, the variogram model, to determine the values of the unsampled locations. So that in areas where we don't have values on sample locations, we can use Kriging from the variogram to interpret more or less what are these values. To do this, of course, 
Kriging on the lies that the estimations must be of a certain nature that is unbiased, having mean error variance, it must minimize the error variance so that there are certain controls used in determining the characteristics. Just to point out again, what are we looking at? These are your sample data. Here is a, a, an unsampled point. What's, what's the value? We don't know. Volumetrically, they'd probably interpolate and say, right, this is x, this is y, therefore this is x plus y plus 2. Kriging doesn't do that. Kriging takes the structure, the variogram, looks at it, and brings about a system where you have a weighted combination of your covariance between the data and the covariance between the unknown data and the other data so that you got a matrix that helps you based on the variogram to determine what is the most likely estimate of that. Next, of course, we move to another phase because Kriggin is just an interim step in the prediction. Kriggin has its shortfalls. The Kriggin maps are smooth and, of course, they don't account, in fact, for all the irregularities that may exist. So conditional simulation is an important step towards bringing about a good value. It, so that is an extension of Kriging. And it produces then stochastic models. It produces the uncertainties that we can work with. It produces lots of what we call realizations, different outcomes to play with, so that we can have a pattern of uncertainty and undergo risk analyses. So what I indicated was that tar sands is important to us. We need to look at it carefully now since our crude reserves are in jeopardy. To get at good estimates to determine whether it's viable commercially, we must then find out what are the real reserves. We cannot therefore look traditionally at what is being done volumetrically and interpolate. We are looking then at a new method, geostatistics. Not just to do the modeling, but to incorporate, in fact, the structure, the geology of the formation. Once we are then satisfied, you can compare values, you can check, try to validate, find out exactly, and then as move on, on a sound footing that we are more or less assured of where we are. I think from that standpoint, we can then look on at how we can extract what methods we can use towards boosting our reserves. I, I just thought that this would briefly generalize and give you a, an outline of what it's about without going into too much details, I guess, in subsequent uh, forums when the data is analyzed and so on, we could uh, update you on, on the progress. Any, any questions then? Yeah, I just have two small ones before I disappear. Yeah. Of course, you know that there's a lot of resistance to tar sands in Canada. Yes. And the pollution is massive. Yeah. I lived there for some time. Yeah. And the, the, the reason for the pollution is the technique for extraction using uh, this water and That's right. open mining and, yeah. and, and then through everything later in the rivers. So the contamination of the water and salmon fishing is, is, is tremendous. Yes. But the technology is still available to look at some other techniques for especially if you have uh, deep deep deposits coming to six hundred feet. Some of the new technologies now they are looking at uh, at the reduction heating using electricity. Mm -hmm. Generate electricity and use it to eat this uh, bitumen and then find some way of pumping it out. Uh, microwave is also proposed in some application. Steam, as you mentioned, that you of course. steam, mm -hmm. where steam comes from electricity or boilers or so. Mm -hmm. so. So, in your opinion, given the fact that there is a tourist attraction to Bagel, and whether the government will be stupid enough to go and 
and, and, and develops a third sense, which is especially when we're talking about the, the, the dramatic effect of the environment, and yes. whether it is a good idea or not. So, so I mean, whether the project is viable from the social side, the side of the economic side. Yes. You see, I'm, 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 it's good to develop. It's two, yes, two yeah. billion barrels of equivalent. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot of money at hundred and fifty dollar a barrel yeah, in yeah. a year or so. So it's it's, it's a good yeah. economy. Yes. But socially and environmentally, what does this do? How is the government thinking? Yeah, we recognize that really to go the way of Canada using the AKS method would not be the correct way. I think it would be cried down, it would not be supported. So what is being done is looking at the retorting method whereby the, 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 the material could be crushed, heated, and cracked. But to do this, you need to analyze it in the lab, and, and that is being done, I think, currently now. Uh, I think Toxfree. Uh, is a company that is interested in looking at the tar sands. They have taken samples, so they're looking at the pyrolysis method. How, in fact, uh, we could. Can I just maybe ask the second one? Yeah. Also, is any company outside of Trinidad showed interest in tar sands and propose some new technology which is not hazardous to the environment? Yes, yes, yes. Tox Free Systems Inc., that's a company that uh, met with Petrotron recently, and they have indicated their interest in looking at the retorting method. And, and once that is proven to be commercial, they, they said it's, it works. Uh, I think it, could, it would help. But I agree that looking at the, the, the normal AKS water method would not work here. No. It, yeah, we, we, we would not be, I don't think it would be favored. I agree with you. But, but you know, I, I think what we really should have mentioned that this project is multidimensional, that you intend yeah. to do a cost benefit analysis, that of you course. intend to do an environmental impact assessment, yes. which makes much of what Professor Sharaf asked moot. Yes, of the course. The thing about it is that your purpose is to assess what is. The ultimate decision to act on what is is not yours. Yeah. But until the facts are before uh, government or the body who has to make the decision, the decision will be made in ignorance. First of all, are you investigating tar sands in Tobago? Tobago? <laughs> well, that is Professor Sharad's question. I don't that know if anybody has heard it but me. Okay, I, I, I didn't get it. Tobago is a tourist attraction. Okay, I missed that. You and well, there you go. I, I, well, I, well, I know it's a true land of Tobago. Paradise. Yes. And one of these things that you will have to do is to look at if uh, the ecology around Powerlands that would be yes. part of your environmental impact assessment. Whatever rivers are in the area, who makes their livelihood from the rivers, it will be a systematic risk assessment. And that will be presented as a package to the government along with a cost benefit analysis which will incorporate the risk assessment. Yes. So the cringing is just, again, to have an idea of the benefit. But the cost will really be developed from looking at the risk assessment to the environment, to the ecosystems, yes. let's say, yes. around the area of development. And I would have thought that this would be done within the context of a selection of methods, of extraction methods, because the extraction step is the most environmentally polluting step. That's exactly the conversion right. of bitumen mm -hmm. to crude oil can be mm -hmm. done in close quarters. Mm -hmm. It is the extraction that is the problem. Yes. So that is the step that you need to assess these risk assessments and, and, and the benefits because the, uh, and cost, because the main cost will be an environmental cost. I mean, it doesn't take much to take a truck and dig it up and, you know, so it's cleaning up the environment and, yeah. and the goodwill that a government will lose with its people. That's right. That will be the real cost. So, I mean, even part of your research, because you also spoke about the project being viable. Yes. I don't know if you heard that, but the viability, because he seemed to think before he left, there was a done deal that this project, it's known that tar sands balloon. So, I mean, his, his phrase was in the trade out that would be stupid enough. <laughs> Give yes. that Tobago 
is a tourist attraction. That was the actual statement. Given that Tobago is a tourist attraction, would the Trinidad and Tobago government be stupid enough to exploit our sands? That's a very loaded statement because it, one, it implies that the, the, it's going to compete with the tourist industry in Tobago, which is not true at all. And the other thing, it implies that the research is, is, is in a sense, trivial because it's, it's already known that tar sands will pollute too much. So, I think you need to clarify some things for Professor Sharaf. Yes, of course. Well, I, said, I am clarifying yeah. it now for yeah. people who will be looking at this video. Too. Yeah, and you're quite right because the extraction method is important. You know, how do you extract? Canada, in fact, is beaten about because of the aqueous method of, of, of right. you but know. what is also important is yes. what your doctoral research is, and it extends beyond the geostatistical analysis. It extends into a comprehensive and systematic assessment of both the benefits yes. and the costs, and the emphasis is on the word systematic, where we will not be eyeballing the data, and volumetric is just one step away from eyeballing, but we will now be looking at um, as much proper information, proven information, yes. as we can, both in terms of the environmental impact, because it may turn out, I don't know parallels. You know, I don't know how pristine an ecosystem is, but I suspect with this dust and with um, their lying so close to the, the surface, it's not all that holds up. Yeah, yeah, it's You know, uh, because mm -hmm. the fumes from that right on the surface may have already had an impact in the area. So the question is, you will need to look at the additional environmental impact. You know, because just from looking at um, the, the going to the area around the Pitch Lake, that is not too wholesome an area. I mean, people go and bathe yes. in the waters that gather there because they maintain that the sulfur does them good. You know, but in terms of it being you know, some pristine ecosystem. It really isn't. Yes, you're correct. The environmental really impact is, is, is because, important. again, probably because the reserves are close to yeah. the surface and may not be as deep as it was in Al as it is in Alberta. Yes. You know, but at any rate, the, the, the whole thing about the, um, the critching and the very ground. The other reason why, what I wanted to ask is, uh, is anybody else using because I guess Professor Sharp was here again when you said that right now Canada is the only country actually mm. mining their tar sands, but that other people are interested in doing so. Of course. Mm -hmm. But um, has anybody else, they've applied um, Cridgen and Toto oil reserves? Yeah, yes, conventional. Yeah, that, that's, that's, they, that's, did anybody else did it with tar sands? No, not of, I've, not of that read so far. But it doesn't really yeah. matter. Yeah, it doesn't matter. What happens here is that everybody's geology is different. Everybody's spatial orientation is different. That's right. And what this is doing is it's like a kind of analysis surveillance where you have a whole lot of factors. You have the petrophysical properties of the bitumen, and we don't know if slight differences in our bitumen from somebody else's bitumen, as well as the depth at which it is found. Yes. For one mm -hmm. thing, the depth at which it is found may indicate that there is a difference in the structure of the, of the bitumen. Because you have so many long chain hydrocarbons and cyclical hydrocarbons and whatnot caught up in that, yes. that you know, a small change in a ratio could change the, the character you know, it's like putting on a big nose or something will change the whole character of somebody's face. So, the thing about it is that you still have to apply the method to your system. That's the key, that's the key, that's the key. You, you, know, you have a tool, but how do you apply the tool right. to your system? And what happens is it looks at the impact of each of these factors, the petrophysical factors, the geological factors, and I think you may be using GPS for this, not so? No, no, no. GPS is not coming in. No, no, no. Well, yeah. You show where you're pinpointing by GPS where precisely you do a sample so that you match the geology there with a direct no. um, GPS coordinate. No, no. We, we, we will be taking values of samples that were extracted 
from boreholes previously. The, right, but yes. those boreholes have to be identified. Yes, yes, they are identified. Precise location. Yeah, yeah, and yes, they of have course. To do that by GPS. Well, they, they, they've got the locations. We have the locations where they they are located. No, so. I'll tell you why. Yeah. Because the whole spatial orientation, mm -hmm. I think, is the GPS coordinates that are going to map when you're doing that simulation. You're going to need the GPS coordinates for that. Yeah, but at any rate, yeah. At any rate, the thing about it is that by looking at how the surrounding factors could impact on the concentration, which is probably why you will find a nugget. Because when you get a confluence of factors that produces an extra amount of bitumen there, it might end up being a bitumen nugget. You know, just as with a gold mine or something. Mm -hmm. And it is finding those areas that will tell you what factors are causing what. So you have so much heterogeneity in this that even, honestly, even with Pridgen, you're going to get a better value, but it's not going to be spot on. But what you will do is you will need to do a cost-benefit analysis from the lower limit to the upper limit. You're still going to have to have some interval estimate. Hopefully it will not be as wide as that one. It shouldn't be as wide as that one. But it will have some width because there's just so much heterogeneity because of the nuggets. I don't know, I, I, I was trying to follow you know, the silly quote of nugget plus structure. We have to talk about that after because I'm not understanding the importance of finding that plateau. Yeah, in, that, terms, that, in terms of getting the, 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 the estimate of yeah. the reserves. That plateau, well of course, I gave a simplistic view, but that plateau is important because it determines the variance. That's the variance, where, where the, the maximum yes, variance is. Yes, faster. yeah. So that you can get your covariance to do your matrix uh, and determine the weighting factors. That's well, the yeah, importance I of it. Mean, I can see why they would want a, a, a constant variance somewhere. But if, if that variance is only constant in certain areas and you do have a lot of heterogeneity, including heterogeneous variances yes. in different parts, finding that and basing the estimate on that is not going to make the estimate any more accurate. Yeah, yeah. So, I don't know, I have, to, I have to talk to you about that. But anyway, thank you for the insight into what it is. So right now, Petro you say is looking at that... Um, uh, Ret retorting? Retorting. Yes, yes, yes. It's the and only... Getting, yeah. the ex getting the information from who? Who has done... Who else has done retorting? Well... Uh, uh, Retorting is being looked at in, in even Canada. Yeah, Alberta is looking at. They have the Tassiak process, the Tassiak retorting process. Uh, but it takes time. It takes analysis of the the, the, the samples and so. Uh, but but the whole procedure yeah. for <coughs> for let's say estimating your cost of retorting. Yeah. Some other people are documenting that. Yes, of course. Right. Yes. Because I think we're going to have to piggyback on this star yeah, science yeah. technology as much as we can. Yeah. The only thing we have to do for ourselves is the geostatistical estimates and the environmental impact statements. Of course. But the rest of the technology, I think we just have to piggyback because it's, it's too costly to be exploring all of that. At any rate, are there any questions? Thank you very much. Well, thank you for listening and hearing and coming and hearing my point of view on that sense. Yeah, well, in spite of what Adele thinks, I think we still have to, uh, we have to explore it. And again, in spite of what he thinks the government has mandated. Yes, of course, that yeah. Ministry of Education that we look at. Yeah. UTP is an entrepreneurial university which has to keep hand in glove with the government. So, yes, uh, yes, yes. I'm very glad you're on that Petra Trin board. Just try and stick to the board. Yeah. Or that, that committee, because it gives UTT a face on that um, initiative. So, but are they looking to you in particular for anything? Or yeah, you yes, of course, I'm, I'm helping with the, the volumetrics and so on. And the, uh, so, they are, in the meantime, they're yeah. doing volumetrics. Yeah, yeah, we're doing volumetrics and estimations of uh, yeah. methods of extraction and so on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, we are working together. Right, thanks.